We've come now to the 27th presentation in our studies here at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and this now is the 11 o'clock study on Thursday morning. Now we'll come back to briefly look at the major arguments in regard to um, the character of God and the revelation of that character is given to us in the Old Testament which as we've said so many people misinterpret to mean that God is a dreadful and fierce destroyer. We made the point <coughs> in our last study period that the life of Christ reveals God to be a loving, kind God who never destroys. In fact, never once in the entire life of Christ upon this did, did he destroy anybody or anything. There are times when he was invited to but he rebuked his disciples by saying you don't know what manner of spirit you are of to ask me to do this kind of thing namely to bring fire down from heaven and destroy the wicked. Now what we have is an evident or an apparent contradiction between the Old Testament revelations of God and the New Testament revelation of God as given by Jesus Christ. The wise and careful Bible student recognizes that contradictions are an impossibility in the Word of God. That is real contradictions. That contradictions can only be apparent but never real. And consequently, he sits at the feet of the Master Teacher, namely God Himself through Jesus Christ, and carefully studies and um, waits upon God to give answers until the apparent contradictions disappear. One big trouble, of course, with the average person in the world is that they don't even consider that there could be a second interpretation to a particular incident. They um, read the words of Scripture to, uh, which are applied to God's behaviour and interpret those words as if they were referring to man's behaviour, despite the fact that in Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 in the very plainest of terms, God has told us that his ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. Which means, of course, if we take those words of instruction very carefully, it means that any interpretation of Scripture in regard to God's character, which defines words in that statement to mean the same as they would mean if they would describe man's behaviour, has to be a false interpretation. Did, did you grasp that sentence? Say that again. Say it again. Right. <clears throat> God's ways are not our ways. Therefore, any interpretation of Scripture which describes the, the behaviour of God, which at the same time defines words in that definition or in that statement about God, in the same way as we would define those words if they describe man's behaviour, any such interpretation must be a false interpretation. Right? Must be a false interpretation. Now, if you sit down and carefully analyse the interpretations of man in regard to God's char character, you find that every one of those interpretations or explanations of God's character does, in fact, interpret the words in, in the text involved as if it was about the character of man every one of those false interpretations do that. Now to me of course one of the clearest examples of the presence of alternative interpretations given in the in the presentation to Pharaoh king of Egypt of God's appeal to him to forsake his evil ways and let the children of Israel go to worship God according to his own directions. Now Moses appeared in the presence of, of Pharaoh and he held his rod in his hand which turned to serpents and then came the ten plagues one after the other as uh, Pharaoh stubbornly refused to repent now here he is the average interpretation of what took place there which interpretation uh, admits of no alternatives in the minds of those who view things in this light Most people look at the story of Pharaoh and, and um, Moses in the land of Egypt and they say, well, the picture is very clear. God came down and he said to um, Moses, now look, I'm, I'm the big boss in the universe. 
I want you to go down there and uh, tell Pharaoh it's time he began to behave himself. And you threaten him. You tell him if he doesn't, doesn't do as I say, I'm going, to, I'm going to hit him and hit him and hit him until he finally does obey me and let the people of Israel go. So down goes Moses with his big rod in his hand. And of course, a big stick is rather a threatening thing, isn't it? And he says to King Pharaoh, All right, Pharaoh, time's up. You've got to start uh, mending your ways down. God has sent a message through me to you. And he's telling me to tell you, unless you do exactly what he says, he's going to, he's going to come down and personally clobber you with plague after plague after plague. And Pharaoh says, Oh, he says, I don't know God, he says. Who is he? Why should I bother about his threats and so forth? I'm not going to obey God. So then Moses says, all right, here comes the first one. And the uh, next day the waters turn to blood. And Pharaoh gets a bit of a shock about this, and so he, he's somewhat repentant and asks for mercy, and God kindly removes the uh, plague. But then Pharaoh turns stubborn again, so God says, all right, he says, that's, that's how it's going to be. You've asked for it, here comes the second one. Bang, comes the second plague. And so we go down the lines, we come to the tenth plague of all, the death of the firstborn. And now Pharaoh is battered into submission and says, All right, I've got the message, he says. You are the powerful one. I will let Israel go. Now, is that not the way in which most people view God's actions in the land of Egypt? Precisely so. Now, if that is the way God behaves, is it different from man's behavior or is it the same as man's behavior? The same. But what does the scripture say? You know, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, God said, right, my ways are not your ways. So therefore, when that interpretation gives to God the same behavior pattern, shows God using the same procedures, the same methods to get his way, as men used to get their way, and not just men, but the very worst of men to get their way, then that interpretation has to be a false one. It's got to be a false one. Now, for instance, let's look at the behavior of the mafia, for instance, and you all know, of course, in big American cities like Chicago, in particular, and New York also, particularly in Chicago, the mafia reign there and regard themselves as being the supreme power in that particular city. And so they say, well, we're the big bosses here, we run this show, and they come down to a selected businessman from whom they wish to extract the protection money, as it's called, in other words, the mafia says, all right, if you pay us protection money, we'll protect you from, from ourselves. And so the man says, oh, I don't respect the mafia. He says, I'm not going to pay you anything. So what do they do? They hit him, don't they? They might smash his shop windows just to start things off. They give him a second opportunity. He still refused to obey, so they burn his car. Then they kidnap his children. Finally, they uh, give him a beating. And eventually the man is either dead and buried or else he's submissive, one or the other. That is the way by which the mafia operates. And if God behaves in the way just described in the land of Egypt, then what difference is there between his way and the mafia's way? There's no difference, right? Now who loves the mafia? Nobody loves the mafia, no one whatsoever. And if God was that kind of God, who would love him? Nobody. Nobody at all. So therefore, it is necessary for us to look again at what took place in the land of Egypt and ask ourselves what really happened back there when Moses came down before Pharaoh. Now, the interpretation of the events which took place there, uh, about the interpretation, I'm going to ask two questions when we get to the end of it. And the first question will be, let's not forget these two questions, is this interpretation which we now are going to advance before you consistent with the revelation of God that was given by Jesus Christ? That's the first uh, question we want to ask. And uh, the second question we want to ask is this behavior pattern that we'll now look at different from the ways of men or the same as the ways of men. Now, we're living in a world in which there is a great enemy whose name is Satan. When we come back to the king of Egypt, I'll just put the word Egypt here to, to indicate the entire land. Now, there was a circle of protection placed around the Egyptians and, of course, Israel, who, who are very much in the same, in the same territory geographically. And this wall of protection had been put there because many, many years before when Joseph had come to the land of Egypt, 
And Pharaoh had obeyed the voice of God, which had come to him in those two dreams about the uh, the lean cattle and the, poor, and the and the healthy cattle and the seven years and so on. You know the story quite well. And when Joseph had been brought in before the mighty worldly monarch or potentate and had conveyed to him the message of God, the king had said, I we shall obey the voice of God. And the result was that Egypt experienced marvelous prosperity. Now, of course, those who obey the voice of God get God's protection. Not that God selects this arbitrarily, but because of the principles involved. But as the years went by, Egypt began to slide into apostasy more and more. And because Satan desired to cut off the royal line from Abraham to Jesus, what did Satan desire to do with Israel? Destroy it. Destroy it. So, so, Satan worked, first of all, to get this wall of protection removed because he would wipe out the Egyptians and the Israelites together. Even though the Egyptians were his friends, his supporters, he was still wipe them out in order to take Israel. That was the all-important thing to him. So number one, Satan worked to break down this wall of protection and he did that, of course, by leading them into deep and deeper apostasy. And at the same time, Satan was marshalling the mighty forces of nature around the land of Egypt in preparation for that day when that wall of protection would be removed and when it was removed then what would happen to the Egyptians? They would suffer plagues brought on by whom? God or Satan? Satan. Now how do we know that Satan has the power to do these things? The Bible says so. Read the book of Job and uh, there is the picture of it in very, very clear terms that uh, God and Satan had this little argument over the righteousness of Job as you remember and Satan said to God, Now you put forth your hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse you to your face. And God said to him, All right, he said, I give him into your power. You go and do what you want to do to him, but don't take his life. And when those dreadful storms and, uh, and uh, raids, raiding parties and so forth burst upon Job and his possessions, he lost all his camels, all his horses, all his oxen, all his asses, all his servants and all his sons and daughters. But who did it? Was it God or Satan? Satan did it. If you read the first chapter of Job, nothing could be more plainly written. Now, <clears throat> God did not, now God is love. The Bible says that in plain terms. Not just Jesus Christ, but God is love. And love does not destroy. Now, if God is love, and if God loves his worst enemies, then did God love the king of Egypt? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did God therefore desire to see Egypt ravaged by these dreadful plagues? Not at all. Not at all. God desired to save the Egyptians. Now in this connection I'd like you to turn to Romans the ninth chapter for a few moments to what many people regard as being a very difficult scripture to understand because it seems to again talk in a way which is contrary to the truth about the character of God. Romans chapter 9, begin with verse 14. <clears throat> we give very careful consideration to this and what other scriptures have to say to understand the character of God as revealed here. <coughs> verse 14 and on, Romans chapter 9. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, <clears throat> Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy in whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And once again, look, let's look at a very uh, seemingly ob obvious interpretation of these words. It says that God raised up Pharaoh, he might show his power in this particular monarch, this great Egyptian ruler. And people say very well then, God was anxious to show forth his power to attract to himself a lot of glory and honour and, um, and credits, a lot of worship. And to do this, God needed to show himself off or to display himself. Now, what, right now, does that interpretation harmonise with the verse that God's ways are not man's ways? Yes. 
No, it doesn't. Do men in this world think up ways and means of displaying themselves and bringing glory to themselves? Is that the human way of doing things? Absolutely. Is that God's way? No, it's not. So this interpretation becomes suspect right away. Now we know of course that when men in shall we say competitive sports such as shall we say boxing or running or uh, cycling or anywhere where they want to excel they or, or tennis for instance supposing for instance I was to go down and challenge uh, Jimmy Connors to a tennis match what would he say? Oh what a joke he wouldn't bother would he to play against me he wouldn't even think of doing that but if one of the world's great men like uh, like Lendl for instance was to come along and challenge him then what would he do? He'd play him because he, kn he now knows he has, has an opponent which is going to give him the opportunity of displaying all his varied skills and powers in the game okay now the thought in this verse that some, as, as some people see it is that God needed a very tough man in the person of Pharaoh who would resist him through plague after plague after plague thus giving God the opportunity to show what power he had to bring frogs and lice and darkness and storms and hail and turn the rivers to blood whereas if, if Pharaoh buckled early God would say well, well, what a shame I, couldn't, I, I was cut short and I couldn't do all these other things I wanted to do to that, that fellow <laughs> now, isn't that the interpretation most people give this verse right but let's now look at another interpretation of the verse showing and, and well, before, before we do look at the other interpretation it, um, if that interpretation is correct if God raised up Pharaoh and deliberately hardened his heart to make him a tough competitor then what do we do with the text which says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life now if God deliberately hardened Pharaoh's heart so he would resist him he'd have to change that scripture he would now have to read that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him excepting for Pharaoh of course shall have everlasting life now can we admit such exceptions on the part of God no, no. no we can't every person that ever lived including this hard hearted Pharaoh had an equal opportunity with anybody else to choose to be saved and to inherit eternal life just as you and I can do so then how should we now look at this verse alright then let's look first of all at the way in which this man was raised up to become what he was Moses spent the first 40 years of his life well not, not all of it but after his mother finally released him to the uh, daughter of Pharaoh Moses spent the greater part of the first 40 years of his life in the schools and the court of Pharaoh king of Egypt and side by side with him there was a companion who at that time was number two to the throne and eventually became the, became the actual ruler of Egypt. Now during those years that those two men spent together, Moses absolutely refused to participate in the worship of Egypt false gods. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be a part of it. And Moses gave everyone in the court of Egypt a very, very wonderful witness of God's power, God's love and God's character. A witness which unfortunately the Egyptians chose to reject although they certainly could have, could have accepted if they had wished to could they not? the free choice was theirs now when that young man who became number one to the throne when, when, Pharaoh, when Moses fled to Midian and um, who was the Pharaoh when he came back from Midian if that young man had chosen to accept God's truth given to him through Moses then what would have happened to his heart? would have been hardened or softened? Soften. but when he rejected that truth then what, what happened to his heart hardened. it was hardened now whether it was softened or hardened was his choice not God's choice God's choice of course would have been for it to be softened but when he chose for it to be hardened then of course it was hardened because it's impossible for you to hear the living gospel of Jesus Christ and come away from it the same person as went to hear it that is over a period of time of course first of all there's that period when you are undecided, you're listening, you're thinking about it, you're, you're drawing conclusions, you're making decisions, you're leaning one way or the other, but finally comes a decision-making point of time when you become a rejecter or an acceptor as the case may be. Now, if you reject it, it will change you, it will harden you, it will 
it will make you more resistant to God's grace but if you accept it of course then you'll become softened and blended by it so then when Moses came back from Midian he faced a very tough and hard Pharaoh made such by that Pharaoh's own rejection of the gospel right now even so that man could still have been saved and when the Lord brought to him the message of salvation when the Lord offered to him deliverance from those dreadful plagues which you'll see more closely in just a moment could Pharaoh at that point of time have decided for God right and if he had have done so would God have been glorified thereby yes. imagine the scene this Pharaoh becomes converted to God's truth to the ministry of Moses he accepts the message of warning that God has for him and he then um, announces to all the Egyptians his new, his new, his new found belief and, and, and commands that the priests learn this new religion and that they then go out and teach all the people throughout the length and breadth of the land of Egypt the truth of God and Egypt becomes a righteous nation and Moses and Pharaoh join together as partners in leading the people to the, fo the, the feet of God the sanctuary service is set up there in the land and Egypt then becomes a bastion of light and truth for all the nations. Now, would that have glorified God? Yes. Would it have shown God's power? Yes. Right? Now, Pharaoh didn't do it that way. As we know, he chose the other direction. And again, God's power is shown in his ability to, to deliver Israel from the land of the Egyptians without himself doing any destroying work. And so the facts are that whichever way, whichever way Pharaoh chose to go... God's power would be shown now in other words by his going by, by his resisting God's word or by his accepting God's word now in which of those ways two ways would God have preferred Pharaoh to have gone in the acceptance of truth right and that would have been a far more beautiful and wonderful and convincing display of God's power than by Pharaoh's rejection of that message and his going the way he did okay so let's come back now to look at Moses there in the land of Egypt. He appears before Pharaoh at a critical time when Egypt's apostasy has become so deep, so flagrant, so violent against heaven that God can no longer maintain this wall of protection around the land of the Egyptians and thus, <clears throat> thus release or, or thus take away the, the, the resistance to Satan's attacks which were being which had been prepared all around that city, uh, uh, around that land, I should say, as they had been. Now, let's go back to Genesis, the seventh chapter, Exodus, the seventh chapter, rather, and uh, we'll notice the um, symbolism of Moses' own presence in the presence of, of, of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Genesis, chapter 7, and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy prophet shall be thy Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. They shall speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he may that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. And of course, God hardened Pharaoh's heart by trying to soften it. And the harder God worked to soften the heart of Pharaoh, the more diligently Pharaoh resisted that and the heart was, heart was made harder and still harder now I'm sure you understand the process by which, by which a person's heart is hardened the appeals of love from God to mankind are very very powerful and to reject them requires a very definite resistance resistance calls for the exercise of certain powers and when you exercise power what does that power become it becomes stronger doesn't it okay it becomes much stronger so when you, when you exercise the powers of resistance against God's love and those powers become stronger and stronger and a person becomes harder and harder instead of becoming softer and softer. Now the point is that Moses came there as God in the presence of Pharaoh. So therefore Moses is a symbol of God and the rod in the hand of Moses is a symbol of God's powers under his control in the world of nature round about. Now note something very carefully. Whatever that rod was in Moses' hand, it was under Moses' control. Which symbolized the fact that whatever nature, the wind, the storm, the rain, the frost, the flies, the lice, and all those various things, while all those things were in God's hands, they were still under God's control. And at no time did Moses ever hold a wiggling serpent in his hand. 
when there was a serpent he reached in the moment he touched it what did it become again? a rod, a rod. so that, that point is very critical to the understanding of this whole drama that that, that rod symbolised the powers of nature first of all well, under God's control and the serpent symbolised the same powers out of God's control now what does the serpent symbolise? the devil or the destroyer right? Satan is the destroyer he's the accuser of the burden therefore he is the destroyer so that um, when that rod passed out of Moses' hands it symbolised nature passing out of God's control and therefore becoming a, a demon of destruction um, out of God's control altogether so that what that power did out of God's control was not God's work or God's responsibility and so God was saying to Pharaoh in the deepest of love Pharaoh I love you I don't want to see you being destroyed but I'm going to demonstrate now what's going to happen if you don't uh, repent and by repentance of course enable me to bring my protection back around you again this is what's going to happen if you don't do it please don't do it don't, don't let this dreadful destruction come upon you and of course Pharaoh scoffed at the idea as we know and he defied the God of heaven leaving God no choice but to withdraw his protection from one area after the other and as that protection was withdrawn of course there was nothing to prevent then the onslaught of those dreadful plagues under the guidance and control of Satan and not the guidance and control of God and of course some people say that's all very well and good but surely the, um, the last plague is too arbitrary it's too selective they just picked out the firstborn of Egypt and left all the rest that's simply explained by the fact that the firstborn of Egypt of course having been specially dedicated to Satan's service was the, was, was, was the child in the family that was farthest removed from God's protection and therefore naturally the first one to fall when a plague came into the family quarters now then my question is my first question is is that picture of God's behaviour consistent with the witness that God has given by Christ in the New Testament mm -hmm. absolutely and is that picture of God's behaviour does that show him to be very different in his behaviour than men upon this earth are his ways different from man's ways? Yes. Absolutely. Now, if you remember that simple point when dealing with people who object to our position on God's character, who do uh, claim and uh, maintain that the Old Testament reveals God as a destroyer, then you'll have no trouble, of course, answering those objectors with their, with their various charges against the character of God and show them then that there is a very consistent relationship between the revelation that is given by Jesus Christ in the New Testament because Christ said if you've seen me you've seen the Father I and my Father are one and the picture of God as given in the Old Testament when that picture is revised to be seen as it really ought to be seen remembering always the principle that God's ways are not man's ways so then the third point before us is that Jesus Christ had to become married to fallen, sinful, mortal humanity in that, so that he might reveal God's character and convincingly destroy Satan's lies about the character of God. And the, um, the principle involved here is found on page 22 in our book Desire of Ages again. Page 22, <coughs> starts from page 21 actually. I'll just quickly summarise that paragraph because I'm sure we all remember the one which we've dealt with it before. Twenty-one, twenty-two, desire of ages. Yep. <clears throat> now the statement tells us that Satan had an objective and it was to make himself first in heaven which is really a comment on Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 14 where Satan said, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God, I shall be like the Most High. That was his objective. To achieve this objective, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. Now, if anyone is not convinced that Satan is the great um, misinterpreter of God's character, one has but to look at the thinking of those folk today who are under his control. Church organisations, worldly people universally today God is looked upon as a great destroyer which is a very serious misrepresentation of his character and the results of this method was to to initiate rebellion into the universe 
Now, the next paragraph goes on to say, on page 22, the earth was dark through misapprehension of God. Page 22, Swan Swansish. 22. It's got to be there. Because some pages are missing. Ah, uh, okay. Right, the earth was dark through misapprehension of God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive powers to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. And the statement says that the darkness upon this earth was caused through the misapprehension of God's character that this problem might be removed, in other words, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, what had to happen? Satan's deceptive power had to be broken. Now, the breaking of Satan's deceptive power could not be done by force. It must be done by demonstration. As you read a little bit further down, to know God is to love him. To know him is to love him. His character is so beautiful so glorious, so wonderful, that knowing him is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Now there's the, there's the, uh, the key sentence in this paragraph. The character of God must be manifested, and what's the next three words? In contrast to, right? In contrast to the character of Satan. And we might recognize the fact, of course, that this is not talking about a partial manifestation of God's character, but a complete manifestation of God's character. It must uh, be, be a, a searching revelation which leaves no areas of God's character unrevealed or that, that, that have not been made plain. Now, at the same time, what about the character of Satan? It must be in contrast to the character of Satan. Does this call for a partial revelation of Satan's character or a complete revelation of Satan's character? In other words, no questions must be left, no hidden recesses, no areas where one might say, well, yes, but what about here and here? Now, in order for Christ to give this demonstration, of course, the next sentence says that there was only one being in the universe who could do this, and that, of course, was Jesus Christ. Now it becomes evident then that Jesus Christ could not and therefore did not give this satisfactory demonstration before Satan was expelled from heaven. Why? Because at that time the full manifestation of Satan's character had not yet been developed, had it? Not yet. And in fact it was not until Satan came down to this earth and captured the minds of men and began to fill the bodies of men with his own evil characteristics that there began, or that there then emerged a, 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 a significant development of that character toward its ultimate rebellious status against God. Now, of course, you may, and this is why, of course, it took 4,000 years before Christ would come to this earth. The scripture says in the Galatians chapter 4, I think, it's, I think it's verse 4 as well, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, and so forth, in the fullness of time. In other words, Christ did not come to this earth until wickedness had reached its height, until the character of Satan had reached its full development, and there was no further depths of iniquity which Satan himself could plumb, uh, nor in, in, inject into wicked, wicked human beings. But you may say to me, well, yes, that's all very well and good, but what about the flood? Don't we find that the wickedness was so great at that point of time that man actually destroyed himself by casting off God's protection and thus bringing the flood upon this earth? To a point, in a certain respect, this is true, but in another respect, it was not true. Now, the flood was 1656 years after creation, or after the fall of man, a mere 1656 years. And uh, as you can read in the first chapter, or, or the first chapters of Genesis, about chapter 5 or 6 or thereabouts, that men were still living to almost a thousand years of age when the flood came. Now, what did this mean? It means that despite their wickedness, so tremendous was their vitality, that the effects of sin were not very manifest yet on the human body, right? 
In fact, I think somewhere in the, in the testimony, testimonies it says that it took about two and a half thousand years, which was another, another 900 years after the flood, before disease began to really rampage through the human family. So at the time of the flood, the effects of sin had not been very, were not yet very marked upon mankind. The sun was still seven times as hot, the moon was still as bright as the sun, the earth was still enjoying a marvellous productivity, and it seemed as if uh, men were sinning with impunity. But when you come down to Christ's day, it's a very different picture, because what did Christ continually encounter so far as physical degeneracy was concerned? It seemed as if everyone was sick, doesn't it? Uh, there were blind people, lame people, sick people, leprous people, and every day Christ spent most of his time bringing healing, restoration to the sick, the physically sick. So there was, of course, a vast difference between the depravity of the physical organism at the time of the flood and the depravity of the physical organism at the time of Christ's first advent, and it was at the advent of Christ that the fullness of time had come. Now, <clears throat> So Jesus Christ had, had to wait until men had reached the bottom physically, mentally and spiritually. Sin, was, sin had become manifest to its ultimate degree. And then Jesus Christ had to come down and reveal the character of God in the same flesh and blood and side by side with the same flesh and blood as that in which Satan was revealing his character. Now, obviously, of course, in order for Christ to do it, he must become married to human flesh and blood. And the relationship that Christ sustained at Bethlehem when he was born of his mother Mary was that Christ did become, in fact, married to humanity. Let's turn to the 22nd chapter of Matthew to help confirm this fact. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, the last few verses where Jesus Christ asked a very searching question of the spiritual or the religious leaders, I shouldn't say spiritual, but rather religious leaders are assembled at this time. <clears throat> verse 41 to verse 45. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Matthew 22, verses 41 to 46. Now here was the question which Christ asked in regard to the Messiah. They said, he said, now here is the Christ. And that word, that word means, of course, the sent one or the Messiah. And he said to them, now, whose son is Jesus Christ? And they correctly said, he's the son of David. All right, that, that was straightforward enough. But then Christ said to him, now, if he's the son of David, how then does David call him Lord, saying, and then we have the reference from the Old Testament in this respect. Now, the word Lord, of course, in this respect means Father, or predecessor, the one who goes before. Now, who was the creator of Adam? Christ was. Okay, he was the creator. And in due time, of course, David was born within the principles of that um, of that creation. So therefore, David owed his life to whom? Right. To the creator, which was Jesus Christ. But then, to whom did Christ owe his owe his um, Humanity to David, right? So therefore, Christ was the father or creator of David and the same time the son of David. Is that a mystery? Is, is, is that a mystery to us? Yeah. Well, sure it is. How, how it could be is beyond our comprehension. But while we can't see how it could be, the facts are we can, we can know that, that it was that way. Of course, back in the ancient Babylonian mysteries, when Nimrod, Samaritans, Tammuz, and those Babylonians were developing their false religion, we find that Satan counterfeited this whole thing very, very cleverly. Just very briefly, of course, there was Nimrod, who was married to a woman called Samaritans, and he died, and legend says he was taken up and became the sun god. Then later, supposedly, Samaritans, many years later, was found with child, 
and the legend was that she had been sired by her husband who was up there in the sun, so a supernatural being and a natural being had combined, the same as, of course, we have Christ who is God and David, and we're thinking here of Mary, of course, the offspring of David, but there's a marriage between divinity and humanity, and Jesus Christ, of course, was as, as God and man was the result of that marriage. Now, that same idea was taught back here, but it was taught that not only was Nimrod the father of this child, whose name was Tammuz, born on Christmas Day, December 25, that's where Christmas Day comes from, in actual fact, that not only was Nimrod the actual father of Tammuz, but Nimrod was Tammuz. So therefore, Tammuz was both the husband of Samarimus and the son of Samarimus. And that was a very, very clever counterfeit of the truth that Christ himself would exemplify when he came to this earth, because Jesus Christ is not, was not only Mary's son, but in a very certain real sense, he was also the husband of Mary. Do you follow that point? Yes. Right? And that's a mystery, of course, very, very much a mystery. So that um, Jesus Christ then came down to the earth, as we said before, he married into humanity. This was very much a marriage or an amalgamation of two different people. Divinity and humanity were combined to produce the Son of God. Or as we normally illustrate this, we find that um, here is God, here is Christ, and here is man, and Jesus Christ partook of humanity in all its fullness, he partook of divinity in all its fullness, and so as Paul says, he made in himself of two, one new man, so making peace, of course, between God and man. Now, only by taking the same flesh and blood as we have got, and tabernacling in that flesh and blood side by side with the flesh and blood in which Satan was manifesting his character, could Jesus Christ bring the revelation of God right down side by side with Satan's manifestation of his character and thus, of course, destroy Satan's lies in regard to the character of God? So, and, and you'll recognize the fact that when you open your Bible from cover to cover, and search in this Bible for revelations of God's character, where is it that you find the clearest and most convincing revelations of God's character? Where? As a man, right? In the life of Christ as a, as a man. And it is a fact that you can go to the, to the person out there in the world who has very little idea of theology and say to him, read through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and what kind of a God do you see? And what will they say? A God of love? a God of mercy, a God of patience, a forgiving God, a loving God, a kind God, and so forth. And you will not, I don't think you'll find anybody, anywhere, who, no matter how poor their religious background may be, if they read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, will not come from that and say, yes, the picture of God as given by Jesus Christ is the picture of love, mercy, and compassion. Isn't that right? So therefore, when Jesus Christ married into humanity and thereby partook of our flesh and blood and became one with us, he thereby gave the clearest and most convincing revelation of God's character ever given at any time in the entire history of the universe. Now, our time is almost gone again, so I'll have to stop very, very soon. 20, 25 seconds, actually. But then doesn't begin, do we begin to see then that there must be great significance in the marriage relationship and this, this is why, because the marriage is so integral a part of Christ's work as our Saviour, Jesus Christ performed his first miracle at a marriage feast in Cana. Now more on the significance of that as we continue our study period again this afternoon. Any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation? Yes. Yes. Um, um. In 2 Samuel 14, 14, it says, God is a God of life. So how can we find that? <laughs> God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. 2 Samuel 14, 14. Mm -hmm. For, for, for he must needs die 
and there is water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again neither doth God respect any person yet doth he devise means that his, ba- that his banish be not expelled from him do you have a different translation? yeah I have a new international mm. yeah. but God does not take away instead mm. take away life instead he devises a way so that a banished person which may not remain estranged from him uh-huh. Why is that? That's, that's what does your say again? Uh, for, for we must needs die, uh, yeah. a, and are uh, as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, but the margin neither, 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 neither doth God take away life, that's the margin, but he devises means that his banished be not expelled from him. So the margin said, neither, neither doth he take away life, right? Which is the truth. God doesn't take away life. He's the life giver, not the life taker. The broken law is the life taker. Second Samuel 14, verse 14. So there's, there's where we're finding. And now you had a question. Did you... Uh, Why do you feel that... Uh, Satan counterfeited uh, the conception. Where? Why? Why? Well, because... No, it's a good question, a very good question, because Satan, Satan does his level best to make his system appear exactly like God's system. And um, now, in false religion, the sun, of course, is the source of life, is sun worship. So they say a supernatural body, the sun, is the source of light. And... Um, Men tend to believe this because um, they know that if you take the sun away, then everything dies. For instance, you, you, you throw a piece of black plastic or a piece of corrugated iron over your, a portion of your lawn out there, and after a few days lift it and the grass is dying. It's all gone yellow and dying, okay? So men recognize if you take the sun away, then life ceases upon this earth. But they forget that the sun is not a life giver, it is only a life sustainer or a life preserver. That's what they forget. And um, when Satan developed a theology in which he replaced God with the sun, then he wanted to make it appear that, that, that his false religion had exactly the same procedures as God's true religion has, but only as a new source of life. And a new source of life supposedly is the sun in the place of God. The idea. Because Satan himself is a creature. And so he wants to establish a creation as the, as the life source instead of the creator as the life source but the procedures remain the same well it also undermines faith in the second I mean in God's system if people want to have an excuse for what they do all they have to say well it's just I mean it's the same thing that happened in what happened before they just copied what went before well it's the same thing but it doesn't work yeah see, see? but they don't look when, when, when Satan produces something which doesn't work and yet it looks like the real thing and people lose faith in the real thing that's good yeah. good question uh, do you think that the way the Bible is written is an effort to speak in parables well, to a point, I mean, the prophecies were always told in symbolic language. The reason being, of course, that um, God was veiling his communications to his army so that the enemy couldn't read those communications. The same as in a, uh, the same as in a, a worldly war, generals were always careful to keep their communications hidden away from the opposite side. But um, in describing God's character, God had no choice but to use the words he uses. And it says God destroys, that's the truth, God does destroy. But, only by trying to say it, God did harden Pharaoh's heart, but he hardened Pharaoh's heart by trying to soften it. The effect was to harden it. So as you might say, you put a piece of ice out there and a piece of wet clay out there, and the same sun will soften the ice and harden the clay. Okay. Right, well let's take a closing hymn and there's some more questions. You're going to pick up this marriage thing 